morning, church. I'm so glad to be with you on this sleep-deprived morning. I'm so happy that we've gathered together. I'm excited that the sun is out and shining because if this was a rainy day, we'd be doomed. We might just have like worship, worship via nap time or something. Um, but the sun is out, it's shining, it's a little bit chilly, and get your blood moving. Um, and we've got another chapter in our series that we've been calling the Poverty Gospel that we're going to be looking at today. And, and I really think that this is going to be fascinating, particularly if you've had any kind of exposure to any religion other than Christianity. Um, and, or if you've had no exposure to religion at all, you might wonder, okay, like religion is for those, those weak, weak-minded people that just need a crutch. They can't get through life by themselves. And religious people just kind of pick one that they like. And I'm, I'm a strong person. I don't need religion. And so Jesus really isn't for me. I don't really have to pay attention to what Jesus says because religion isn't my deal. Um, and I just like to push back on that a little bit. I'm, I'm somebody who's a fan of Jesus. I think what he has to say is actually like going to be helpful to your life and how you see the world. And so I'm going to push back on that a little bit. And I really want to push back on the idea of calling following Jesus a religion. There's, a, there's an essence in which, yes, it is. But there's an essence in which if we just do the religious um, rituals or the religious practices, if we just do the things that Christians do, then we've missed the whole point of it. The poverty gospel isn't just a religious system that we can you know, copy and paste into our lives and then it'll, it'll make us better people. It, it, it's a transformational thing that changes who we are fundamentally. So I'd like to look at that together. Um, if you guys are going to track, we're going to, we're going to track with us together this morning. We ready for this? Are we ready for this? Woo! Yeah. Okay. We're going to, we're going to do some jumping jacks here. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> let me invite you to pray with me as we begin um, and pray with me the disciples prayer. And if you're not familiar with it, the words are there on the screen, but would you pray with me? Our father in heaven, Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Excellent. If you would, open up your Bibles. We're going to be in uh, Luke chapter 5, in verses 30, beginning in verse 33. And if you want to use one of the blue Bibles that are there in the chairs in front of you, it's on page 1075 is where we're actually going to start in verse 33. 1075 in the blue Bibles. We're in Luke chapter 5. You want to navigate there on your app or whatever it is. Luke chapter 5. And we're going to begin in verse... 33. If you were with us last week, we're actually picking up the story in the exact same place where we left it off last week. So if you recall, as we, or if you didn't, you can follow up on um, the podcast or on YouTube or Facebook or whatever, um, our website. You can watch the sermon from last week. But where we concluded was actually in the midst of a party. Remember, Jesus invited the tax collector, Levi. He said, hey, would you come and follow me? Levi said, yeah. He left the tax booth and he, he brings Jesus back to his house and he throws a big feast. So there's a big party. And he's invited all of his friends. And remember, the Pharisees were talking to his disciples. Why do y'all, why do y'all, why y'all at this party? Don't you know who's here? And then Jesus answered them. Remember that? Um, so we're actually picking up in the exact same thing. So when, you, when we read this, like picture yourself in a party scene. Like we're at somebody's house, there's a party going on, and this is what's happening. Luke chapter 5, verse 33. And they, um, being the Pharisees and the scribes, they said to him, so they're talking to Jesus now. <laughs> the disciples of John fast often and offer prayers, and so do the disciples of the Pharisees. But yours eat and drink. And Jesus said to them, Can you make a wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? 
The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. He also told them a parable. No one tears from a new garment, tears a piece from a new garment and puts it on an old garment. If he does, he will tear the new and the piece from the new will not match the old. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the new wine will burst the skins and it will be spilled and the skins will be destroyed. But new wine must be put into fresh wineskins and no one after drinking old wine desires new. For he says, the old is good. So there's a couple of things that we're going to have to talk about to to wrap our heads around this, because what Jesus is doing, which I think is a a great principle in general as a teacher, is he takes things from their everyday life and uses that, the thing that they're familiar with, to to teach them something they're unfamiliar with. The problem is they had a different everyday life than us. And so the examples that he uses, I have to teach you the example in order to be able to help you get the principle that he's trying to get to. Does that make sense? So first, let me point out, again, they're in a party. Um, the, uh, Jesus has called Levi to follow him, and the Pharisees are upset about it. And Jesus says, hey, I didn't come for the well people. People who, who aren't sick have no need for a doctor, but I came to call sinners to repentance. So, so don't pester me about who, who the people I'm spending time with is, because I came to deal with the people who know that they need help. And, and, and the interesting thing is now the Pharisees are talking to him, but they don't even really ask him a question. They're just kind of making an observation. They say, hey, John the Baptist, like you're friends with that guy. Like you, you seem to be on the same page preaching repentance. Like John's disciples, they all fast. They're real pious. They're real religious kind of dudes. And, 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 and disciples of the Pharisees, the people who study the law, they fast too. But, but you... And the people who are following you, you guys are at a party. You guys are eating and drinking. Like, what's the deal? I thought this was like a religious movement. Like, aren't you, aren't you supposed to be like suit and tie dressed up in a synagogue somewhere? Like with a, with a stick up your butt, not having any fun? Like, what's the deal with this? And he just says, can you make wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? Essentially, I'm doing something here, and it's cause for celebration. And can you go into a wedding dressed all in black and demand that nobody have a good time? Like, weddings and funerals are two separate things. They don't really mix. You're, you're, uh, there's, a, there's an element of mourning and grief in a funeral, even though it is a time of celebration. It's a different kind of celebration than a wedding. And right now, I'm the, this is the wedding party. There's going to come a time where there's fasting and mourning, but it's not today. He says, look, no one tears a piece from a new garment and puts it on an old garment. So this is something that maybe we're not familiar with, especially if we're younger, um, if we're in middle school or high school. There's a thing that people used to do. They used to like have pants and want the pants to be complete with no holes in them. I know that this is a new concept for you guys. People used to want to wear pants that didn't have holes in them. And so if their pants got a hole in them, that was seen as a bad thing. So they would actually like put more cloth over the part that had a hole in it so that the pant would be complete. Does that seem kind of goofy? It's a little bit goofy, but that's what they used to do. And so what would happen is if you took, if they made the cloth, and that's another thing, but they were making the cloth. And if you took a piece of new cloth that you had made and you put it on a pair of old pants, The way that the fabric interacted together, the the new fabric hadn't been stretched properly and it didn't have the same wearing. So if you sewed these two fabrics together, they would rip apart, the patch wouldn't work. So what they would do is they'd take the new fabric and they'd wash it really, really good and make it so that it would be aged-ish a little bit so that that when they put new fabric on old pants, they they wouldn't make a hole. Because he makes the point, he says, look, if you put new fabric that hasn't been torn and you put it in these new pants, like the new fabric's just gonna rip. You're gonna ruin both things by trying to do this, all right? And then he talks about wine skins. And we, we store wine in, in glass bottles. We store wine in glass bottles because they're less likely to break. But at the time, in the technology that they had, what they had were like literal bladders, like animal bladders, or animal skins that they would, they would take the fur off of and then uh, fill the skin uh, with, with wine. Kind of like wine in a bag, 
but when the only bag you have like came from like legit animal products, animals were harmed in the making of these things. <clears throat> it's just how life was for them. <clears throat> but if they like the thing was is is if you put new wine into it, the new wine isn't finished yet. It hasn't finished fermenting yet. And so there's still a process. And when wine ferments, it releases gases and, and things like that. And so if you put new wine, which is, is releasing gases and fermenting still, into old wine skins that have already been stretched to their max, they've already had their age, they're, not, they're more brittle, then if you put the new wine in the old wine skins, you're going to break your bag. The bag can't take it. But if you make new wine, then you better have a new bag for it that has the elasticity to be able to stretch. There's this, do you see? There's this dynamic, this contrast between what's new and what's old that he's trying to get at. The new and the old don't mix together without conflict. Parents of teenagers, the new and the old do not mix together without conflict. I don't even get an amen on that. Come on. Teenagers, like the new, the young people and the old people don't get together and not have any conflict, right? We disagree about stuff. Okay, there we go. I'm like, I'm like, you guys know this. This is sometimes I like I like say to something and I'm like, I'm I'm touching their soul right here, and you guys are like, oh, I don't know about that. Okay. Okay, that's what I'm saying. I'm I'm throwing, I'm rolling those balls right down the middle, right there. Okay, all right, no. <laughs> We're going together. You said we do this together. <clears throat> he says, look, new and the old don't go together without any kind of conflict. He's saying, you guys are concerned about fasting. And fasting at the, at, at, in the Jewish tradition like, was, was, was good. Like It was part of what God wanted for, for his people to take times and seasons to fast. And so... What, had hap- what I think had happened was people had taken that fast and said the fasting, the process of fasting becomes the thing that makes us holy as opposed to what am I giving my attention to while I fast? If you go without eating, even if you're, even if you're like a spiritual person and you go without eating for a spiritual reason, if, if I stop, if, I, if I'm praying for the community every, every day uh, of the year, and I take one meal and I fast a meal. If I give my attention during the meal that I'm fasting to how hungry I am, it's not making me holier. <laughs> what am I? What am I giving my attention to? The the the, the pre- like stopping eating or stopping or pre- preventing yourself from doing something to set yourself apart from God is 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 to redivert your attention towards either His grace and His goodness to you or to the suffering of other people. Like, get your attention off of yourself, get your attention off of the hunger, and get it towards the things that God would have your attention directed to. And he's saying, look, like you guys, you guys got locked in on the fasting, and you've missed the heart behind it. The day will come when, when my disciples will fast again, but today isn't that day. Today I'm going to show them how to party well. And he, and, he, and he closes with this, with this line. No one, after drinking the old wine, desires the new, for he says the old is good. And I think he's playing here on, like, wine. Like, typically, older wine costs more money. Like, it's supposed to be better. I don't, I don't know. I'm not a wine person. But it's supposed to be better. The old wine is supposed to be better. If you've had old wine, if you had really good old wine, you don't want the new stuff. You don't want that $10 stuff at Walmart. Like you want the old expensive stuff, right? He's saying, look, if you if you have been locked into this system where it's easy, one plus one equals two. If I don't eat, then God is happy with me and I get good good things from God. The 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 system is easy. It's it's about the thing that I can do is what makes me right with God. If you, have, if you have an equation of life that works that way, I don't want something that introduces some kind of variable that means like God is actually a person that I have to have a relationship with and he doesn't necessarily deal with me based upon the things that I deserve. Sometimes he gives you things you don't deserve, like grace. And sometimes he saves you from things you do deserve. 
Do you see where I think he's driving at? Here's, here's, here's a question. Do we let what we know prevent us from growing? Do we let what we already know prevent us from growing? See, I don't think, I don't think Jesus is saying that fasting is bad. I don't think he's saying that we should not fast. Although, like, to be honest with you, this, this passage this week threw me in a deep dive trying to figure out whether or not fasting was Christian. And I'm not sure that I've necessarily landed precisely where I needed to be, but I, I don't think he's saying like, never fast. But he's saying when you do fast, what is your attention on? And so do, do I let what I already know determine whether or not I'm willing to grow in any given area? Do we have a posture of humility that when new information is presented to us, we consider it? Or do we, when faced with new information, say that can't be? Are we willing to learn? Or do we have it all figured out? It'd be really easy for me to ask the teenagers, do we have it all figured out? But I think, I think, us, I think us grown up people, we do the same thing. They learned it from us. Do we ask more questions than we insist on the answers that we already have? Do we let what we know prevent us from growing? Let's continue reading in chapter 6. Oh, let me, let me say too. Jesus' good news breathes life into religious practices. This is our big idea for the morning. Jesus' good news breathes life into religious practices. The Pharisees are trying to point people, or trying to point Jesus to the fasting, the religious practice. You're not doing the religious, you're not doing the religion thing right. And he's like, no, 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 no. We'll get there, but now is not the time. And and you have so misread what God is doing in the world that you actually are doing the religious practices wrong. You have missed the good news, which is not that you can earn your way to God, but that God is making a way back to Him through His Son. Jesus' good news breathes life into religious practices. It's not that the religion gives us life. It's that it's the good news in the form. Is that, it's kind of like splitting hairs, but I think it's important. This can get confused in my heart real, real quick. So I'm hoping that it becomes clearer as we go. Let's continue reading in chapter 6 and verse 1. On a Sabbath, while he was going through the grain fields, that's Jesus, his disciples plucked and ate some heads of grain, rubbing them in their hands. But some of the Pharisees said, Why are you doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath? And Jesus answered them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry, he and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and took and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priests to eat, and also gave it to those with him? And he said to them, The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. So we'll pause there. There's a couple of things that are that are at play here. I feel like I should mention first David. So Jesus cites a, a story that's in the Hebrew scriptures in the Old Testament where where David was actually on the lamb. <laughs> uh, he wasn't king yet, and him and his boys, which were essentially um, essentially an army, for lack of a better term, um, were running away from King Saul because David had been appointed to be the next king and Saul didn't want that to happen, so he was trying to kill David. There's a warrant out for his arrest. And it wasn't a bench warrant. They were coming for him. So they're running and trying to get David and David's like running, running, running and he comes across this, the, uh, it's kind of like a, a temple outpost type deal where they would do the, the things that would happen in the temple but it wasn't necessarily in Jerusalem. It was in a different place. So they go into this makeshift tabernacle type thing and they take, he says, what do you have to eat? And the priest is like, we don't really have anything to eat. It's not, not good times, except for the bread that we bake every day and we put in the presence of God and it's there dedicated for God and only the priests are allowed to eat it at the end of the day so that we don't have to throw away something that's holy. So that's the only thing we got. And David says to him, he says, 
we're anointed, we're set apart. We are um, sanctified in that we didn't bring any ladies with us. Uh, I'll allow you to read between the lines. It says, we are, we're pure and we're in need. Can we take that? Can we use that? And, and the priest gives it to him. Ends up giving him a sword too, but that's not what Jesus is talking about. So, he's, so, so now, on a Sabbath, so this is the seventh day of the week. This is a Saturday for the Jews. This is a day where they're not allowed to do any kind of work whatsoever. They're not even allowed to tell their slaves to do work because by doing so, they're doing work. All right, so this is like they're going on the Sabbath and they have a certain number of steps that they're allowed to take. And I don't know how they did that without Fitbits, but they did. And they were going through and they were walking through the grain fields. And as they're going, they're just kind of picking, picking the tops of the grain and rubbing it together and then eating the seed which was allowed. They weren't like stealing it, um, but this was, this was what they were doing. And as they're going, and, and the Pharisees are like, oh, labor on the Sabbath. They're working, they're harvesting, they're threshing, they're, they're, they're separating, like they're doing work. Like it's one thing to go on a walk. You're allowed to walk on the Sabbath because you, there's some things that you just, like there's just some things that we can do, but you can't work. You should have already prepared your meals. You should have already baked your bread. You should already have it with you everywhere you go. Like you're not allowed to stop at the convenience store and because then somebody else is going to like, you're not allowed to do it. And Jesus says, hey, don't you have the same Bible I do? Don't you remember David? Don't you like David? He's like the best king ever, right? Don't you remember what he did? He ate the thing that only priests were allowed to eat. And he concludes that by saying, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. This Son of Man title is, is one that Jesus uses to refer to himself. Um, and this is actually the second time that he's, he's used it. He used it in, in chapter 5 when he um, healed the paralyzed man. He, he, he said, that in order to prove to you that the Son of Man has authority to do this, I say, get up and walk. This is the second time he's used the title of himself, and it's a really interesting title. Um, it comes out of Daniel, but the Jews at the time didn't necessarily use it as a term for the Messiah. It wasn't something that they, that they associated with the Messiah. It was kind of like, anyway, it's a really, really interesting, fascinating name, and I'd invite you to do some, some work on reading it, or some work on, on seeing where it comes from. He says, the Son of Man, I am Lord of the Sabbath. Essentially, I made the rules. Like, these guys aren't actually breaking it. They're not, they're not working. I wonder if he's like looking into their heart and like is seeing the intention of their heart and, and knows that they were just being whatever. They weren't like, just get, a, just get a bite to eat. It's fine. He says, look, I made the rules. <laughs> the Pharisee is like, the, no, God made the rules. Yeah, yeah, I made the rules. That's what I said. And here's the thing. They had made this whole rule book for the Sabbath. They're like, God said to rest on the Sabbath. God said to, to not do any kind of work on the Sabbath. What does it mean to not work? What does it mean to work? And so they made this whole rule book about how not to rest on the Sabbath. They made this whole tradition. And it's still in effect today. It's actually actually really, really fascinating. Um, last February, when uh, Jesse and I were able to go to Israel, it, on the Sabbath, on Saturdays, they have what they call a Shabbat, which is the Hebrew word for Sabbath, a Shabbat elevator, which the doors open, the doors close, it goes to the next floor. The doors open, the doors close, it goes to the next floor from Friday night until Saturday night. It just hits every floor all the way up and hits every floor all the way down. They turn it on on Friday night so that nobody is doing any work on Saturday. And so that way they can use the elevator without having to push a button because pushing a button is work. And I like... <laughs> I, I ran into a guy in the hotel and he was clearly a, 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 an Orthodox Jew and he was waiting at the Shabbat elevator and I was like, oh, you can ride with me and I get in and he gets in with me with his two boys and I, I'm only going like one floor up or something because I was going to a different person's room. I wasn't going to the lobby. 
and I get in and I'm like, I'm going to this floor. What floor do you want to go to? He can't tell me. He's not allowed to tell me what floor to push, even though I'm a Gentile, because that would be the same as him commanding a slave to do work. And so, so he can't tell me what floor to push the button. So I push the button, go to my floor, and he just gets out and goes and stands in front of the, the Shabbat elevator because I didn't, I didn't know what to do. It's really interesting. They have the whole, this whole rule book about how, the, how all the things work. And they missed, maybe, they may miss the heart of what the command was. We're so worried about not breaking the rule that we've forgotten why God rested to begin with. Do we allow our traditions to govern God's word? Do we allow our traditions to govern God's word. These are people who had a whole rule book for how to follow God's word, and they were astonished that somebody would do something that wasn't written in their traditions. And, and he's like, I've made the, I've made the rule. I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. I, I'm the one who started this. I'm the one who rested on the seventh day. I set the example for you. What do you mean you're going to tell me how to Sabbath better than you? <laughs> do we allow our traditions to govern God's word. Let me just imply that it ought to be the other way. We go, oh, no, 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 Michael. We don't, we don't let our traditions do that. But if we didn't have chairs on a Sunday morning or the chairs were arranged in a different way, it would throw us off. And we'd say, I don't think I can worship God like this today. If I'd have wore a suit and tie this morning, it would have been a distraction from our worship. If I'd have worn shorts and flip-flops today, it would have been a distraction from our worship. And I, I toyed with doing both of them and thought, that's not, I, I'm not going to make my point. But even outside, our traditions today aren't necessarily just the things that we inherited from our families or from the faith tradition. Like, like I wonder if our traditions may even equal our favorite pundits, whether they be newscasters or podcasters or whether it be the people that we follow on Facebook do we allow our traditions to govern God's word do we say like this is this is the Christian interpretation and so now I must stand on this hill and die on this hill do we allow our traditions to govern God's word and it could be even a reverse legalism too. Some of my closest friends um, are people that can't stand church people. They're like, church people are so fake. Church people are like, blah, 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 blah. They're not actually following Jesus. And, and, I, and, I, and they, they say, they would say, church people are, are just such Pharisees. They're so, they're so hypocritical. And so I just can't stand to be with them. And I, I can understand what they're saying, but I, I also want to like push back on them a little bit. Like, hey, Jesus came for them too. Like, yes, Jesus was harsh towards the religious people, but he also died for them. His, the, the command that Jesus leaves us is to love our neighbor, not to love our pagan neighbor who doesn't know better. To also love our hyper-religious neighbor who thinks that they're in charge. Like, everything that Jesus did was an act of love, and so giving rebuke and giving correction. And if you remove yourself from people that you don't get along with, then you have no opportunity to love them. Do we allow our traditions and our preferences to govern God's word? And Jesus says, I'm Lord of the Sabbath. Let's take a look at one more passage together. In, ver in chapter 6, verse 6. I will if you'll be quiet. Thank you. Chapter 6, verse 6. On another Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was teaching. And a man was there whose right hand was withered. And the scribes and the Pharisees watched him to see whether he would heal on the Sabbath so that they might find a reason to accuse him. But he knew their thoughts and he said to the man with the windered hand, come and stand here. And he rose and he stood there. And Jesus said to them, I ask you, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm? To save life or to destroy it? 
And after looking around at them all, he said to him, Stretch out your hand. And he did so. And his hand was destroyed, was restored. Excuse me. His hand was restored, but they were filled with fury and discussed with one another what they might do to Jesus. So now we're in the synagogue on a Sabbath, which is where we were all supposed to be as good Jews. And Jesus is, is teaching, he's preaching, and, and he goes. And there's a guy, and it sounds like this is a little bit of a setup. Like, I wonder if they went out and found a dude that had a crippled arm to bring him to Sabbath or to bring him into the synagogue so that they could see. Like, they, they were clearly trying to set Jesus up to see what he's going to do. And so they're like, is he going to heal on the Sabbath? And so he's teaching or whatever, and he notices the setup, and he just leans right into it. They're trying to trick him, and he just leans right into it. He says, hey, come here. And he calls this guy up with a withered arm, and uh, everybody's looking at him. And it's like the, the, the subtext in the room is so clear to everybody, right? Like, have you ever been in those situations where verbally nothing has been said, but by the actions, everybody knows what the meaning of, of the thing is going to happen? Like, everybody knows. They brought the, the guy with the crippled, everybody knew he didn't belong here or whatever, and, and Jesus is like, hey, come stand up here. And he just asks him. And that just makes me wonder. Like, these are the questions that I have for Jesus when we get there. What text was he preaching from? Like, because I feel like this was related to the sermon. Like, that, that's just what I think. But he, he's preaching, he said, hey, come, come stand up here. And, he, and so he asked the people, I wonder if there's an application question. Which is, which is better? To, to, is it lawful to do good or to do evil on the Sabbath? Well, I don't know. I don't think you're supposed to do anything. Is, is, it, is it lawful? What does he say? Is it lawful to save a life or to destroy it? And so he says to the guy, he says, uh, lift your hand up. And he lifts his hand up, and it's perfectly normal. And they are furious. See, up until this point, it's, Luke is real, real clear as he describes Jesus' healing ministry. He's constantly touching people. Coronavirus like, was not a concern for him. He's constantly touching people. Every time he heals somebody, almost, he, he, he's touching them. Or he's, he's giving them some kind of instructions. Or he's, or he's saying verbally, you are healed. Like, there's always some kind of indicator that Jesus has given. Like, I am doing a miracle here. Like, this is happening. It's coming from me. And here, there's none of it. He has the guy stand up. The guy stands up. He asks a question. He says, hey, uh, would you raise your hand for me? Oh my gosh. Like, he didn't, he didn't say you were healed. He didn't say because of your faith you were healed. He didn't touch him and say, like, you're, you're healed now. Or go and be well and show yourself to the priest. He doesn't do any of that. He just says, hey, pick your hand up. And they're so mad. They're now, they're now uh, filled with fury and discuss what they might do to him. Like, they're going to get revenge now. Because I guess he didn't actually heal he didn't actually do any work because he didn't say anything. He didn't touch the guy. Like, I don't know how he did it. I don't know how he did it. Like, he, we, we set up this trap. It was perfect. He couldn't resist the, paral the, the guy with the arm. Like, he's, a, he's like a little puppy dog. Like, we set this up perfectly, and he, he, he got out of the trap anyway. <clears throat> how do we respond when God challenges our perception? How do I respond when God challenges my perception? Am I filled with fury? God, I can't believe you would, you would save that person. I can't believe you would do those miraculous things through those people who don't really like, they don't, the way they read the Bible is just wrong. God, I can't believe that you, you, you would extend grace and kindness and mercy to people that like won't take care of themselves. How, how do we respond when God challenges and pushes against our perception? Are we arrogant and, and, and say, God, you're not doing it my way, so it must not be you. It's got to be a demon. Or are we humble and say, God, I didn't, I, I, 
I didn't see that coming. Do we fall back even on our traditions and say, but, but God, don't you know how it's supposed to be done? Or do we say, God, you made the rules. And if I have violated the rules accidentally, then show me how you want to change my heart. How do we respond when God challenges our perception? Because there's people in, in the room at this time. And the next thing that Jesus is going to do is he's going to take some time away and he's going to pray. And when he comes back from that time of prayer, he's going to call people to be his disciples. He's going to set them up as apostles, the 12 that we know. And I think that, it, <laughs> that we can't miss that he is, he's pushing on these religious practices to say, don't put your faith in these practices. These practices are all designed to point to me. And if you miss the good news that I tried to embed in these practices and you worship the practices themselves, then you will miss me. And so then, then after he's pushed on these and pushed on these and pushed on these to the core of the Jewish soul, which week after week worshiped the Sabbath, like this is a part of what they do to this day. And he says, if, you, if I got to push on this, I got to push on this because I'm going to call you to be my apostles now. And the 12 will answer the call. But the challenge for us, the call for us, is how do we respond when God challenges our perception? Will we follow him if he won't fit into our pocket? Because Jesus' good news breathes life into religious practices. Would you pray with me? God, we need you, and we need you to direct our thoughts and minds and how to apply this text. God, there's things that have come to mind this morning that maybe you've been working on us for a while, and maybe it's brand new, and we're not sure quite how to do with it. But Lord, we pray that you would give us a humble heart to respond to you appropriately. We acknowledge that you wrote the word you're the authority on it. And so God, if there are areas where we've misunderstood or misapplied, God, if there are things that I've said that have just been my opinion or my tradition that don't jive with, with your word, God, I pray that you'd wipe those things clear of our memory. But oh Lord, what's your word would stand true in our hearts, mold us and shape us. Would you set us apart by your truth? And would you continue to breathe life into us? We need you. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.